Good afternoon. Good afternoon, fellow Africans, wherever you are, whether you are in Johannesburg, South Africa, Luanda in Angola, Windhoek in Namibia, Niamey in Niger, Nairobi in Kenya, Nokchot in Mauritania, or Tunis in Tunisia. I'm happy to join with you this afternoon to engage in a conversation that I have no doubt is significant to the people of Africa. It is also very necessary at this very introductory moment for me to thank the EFF who have found it fitting to organize this conversation, which I think is as topical and as evergreen as it has ever been. The question that we want to interrogate today is Pan-Africanism. And many scholars have said many things about Pan-Africanism, and I will not therefore detain myself by defining what Pan-Africanism is. Suffice it, however, to say that when we talk about Pan-Africanism, we are talking about uh, mental, moral, and cultural consciousness, which recognizes our Africanness and the need for Africans, whether in the mother continent in our, in the diaspora, to work together as a unit for the purpose of realizing what is in the best interest of the African peoples. I want to start my conversation out of a speech that was delivered by Tanzania's the late President Mwalimu Julius Kambarage Nyerere on the sixth day of March, 1997 in Accra, Ghana. On that day, Mwalimu was invited to talk about African unity and he titled his presentation Without unity, Africa has no future. And Mwalimu said that when we think about the continent of Africa, we are united by the fact that over the centuries, we were hunted down as slaves. And after we had been enslaved for 400 years, we were colonized and that our enslavement and our colonization became the glory of other civilizations. He went on to say, it is therefore incumbent upon us to recognize that our unity is the only salvation and the only immunity that we can have if we were and if we are to protect ourselves against other civilizations. He went on to say that it was not lost on him that Ghana was on that day celebrating her 40th anniversary. He was equally happy to record that he was speaking in Accra, which was the capital of Pan-Africanism. He reminded his audience that in the month of February 1994, the process of liberation had been completed with the conquest of the apartheid regime in South Africa and the rise of Nelson Mandela to the presidency of that nation. He went on to say and to admit that Africans had been wrong not to unite. He went on to say that Nkrumah had been right in demanding as early as 1957 that Africans had to unite. That story is important because it underscores the significance of African unity as a condition sine qua non to the progress of Africa. But one cannot start the conversation of African unity without going back to history. Many of us will remember that the very first idea of what may now be described as modern day Pan-Africanism was in the year 1897, when that great Trinidadian, Trinidadian Henry Sylvester Williams convened a meeting of the African Association later to be called the Pan-African Association. Williams at that time 
had tried to persuade the Africans in the diaspora that they had a duty to ensure that going forward, they were not oblivious to the plight of their kin and kith in the continent of Africa. But even Williams had been animated by the early works of Marcus Garvey. You will remember as early as the year 1820, Marcus Garvey had started his movement back to Africa. And Marcus was reacting to slavery, which had been dehumanizing. And he was telling the blacks, we must go back to our mother continent regardless of which countries we came from, because these countries that now constituted the continent of Africa were rudely divided by the Europeans in Berlin in 1884, a little later. But what is significant about the Marcus Garvey movement, although it was labeled a failure, is that when the blacks in the continent of America heard about those efforts, it energized the abolitionist movement. And therefore, by 1863, when Abraham Lincoln was signing the Proclamation Treaty, it was as much a contribution of the uncelebrated efforts of people like Marcus Garvey. But Marcus Garvey aside, it is Williams from Trinidad whose activities spawned modern-day Pan-Africanism. And we remember that Williams in the year 1900 organized a meeting in London. And that meeting held in London and organized by the, that great man was the beginning of the efforts towards bringing Africans, irrespective of where they were geographically, geographically resident, to talk about Africa. The 1900, 1900 meeting was followed by yet another meeting in 1919. And that meeting was organized by yet another great African and great Pan-Africanist, W.B. Dubois. And Dubois was telling his audience at that time that our kith and kin in the continent have been enslaved. Our kith and kin have been colonized. And if we do not support them, they will not regain their independence. The 1919 meeting was followed once again by the 1921 meeting and 1923 meetings, both held in London. And ultimately, in 1927, there was a meeting in New York. But the most critical meeting for Pan-Africanism, at least the one that we can relate to in the continent of Africa, was in 1945 that was held in Manchester in the United Kingdom. Why well, I think that that was very significant because Africans were represented there. Kwame Nkrumah represented Ghana at that meeting. Peter Abrahams was present from South Africa. Hastings Ngwazi Kamuzubanda was present from Malawi. Jomo Kenyatta was present from Kenya. Obafe Miawolo was present from Nigeria, and there were representation from Jamaica and from Trinidad and from the United States of America. The 1945 meeting was critical because at that time, all African countries were under the tutelage of colonization, except for Ethiopia and Liberia. Liberia having been established as a settlement for freed slaves in 1847, and Ethiopia, of course, through the exploits of Emperor Menelik, had defeated the Italians at the Battle of Adoa and were never, therefore, successfully colonized. After 1945, the struggle for independence was moving in earnest, and I think that the World War had helped in this regard the freedom of India in 1947 had also helped in making colonization as a form of control to be one that was not very attractive to the colonizing powers. Which brings me to the question of how Africa was then divided. Africa, as we know, was divided in Berlin in 1884 and it was divided at that time amongst 
the European powers, uh, chiefly the United Kingdom, Spain, Portugal, Germany, and of course, the Belgians through the activities of Leopold, sometimes referred to as Leopold of the Congo, had also succeeded. Of course, there were also other areas. The Arabs were present as, as colonizers in Zanzibar, the Omani Arabs. And we know that that particular exercise of the partition of Africa was deliberately designed to ensure that African countries were easy to manipulate. But as I've said, by 1945, the United Nations organizations have been, having been established in San Francisco in the United States and the Universal Declaration of Human Rights also having been endorsed in Paris, France in 1948 had recognized that colonization was dehumanizing. So that on the sixth day of March, 1957, when Ghana regained her independence, Kwame Nkrumah was very clear. And I think Kwame Nkrumah is not credited as much as he should be in this struggle for pan-Africanism. If you listen to Kwame's statement or his speech on the day of the independence, he was as clear as he was passionate that the independence of Ghana meant nothing if the rest of Africa was not free. And he started in earnest to energize other African leaders. You remember that it is at that time that the French Fourth Republic was also being introduced with the return of Charles de Gaulle into power. And at that time, what majorly happened for the benefit of Africa was the decision of Guinea through Ahmed Sekotoure to, to vote no so that they could gain their independence. And by 1958, we now had Ghana and Ghana representing the former British colonies as having regained our independence. And of course, Guinea Conakry representing the former French colonies having regained their independence. And it is significant at that time that Kwame Nkrumah remains very faithful to his agenda because in 1958 in Accra, Ghana, he calls a meeting, the All African People's Meeting. And what he is telling the leaders at that time, at the leaders of the countries which were independent at that time, and in that meeting, the countries represented were Ghana, Guinea, Ethiopia, Sudan, and Egypt. And he was telling his stalwarts at that time, if we are going to conquer the colonialists, we must be united and we must move as one united front. And it is instructive that although Ghana was independent, in 1959, Kwame Nkrumah convinces Ahmed Sekotoure and William Tubman of Liberia to sign a treaty in Sanquil in Liberia to think about Africa as a united front. There are a series of meetings at that time. The first meeting that we see at that time is in 1960. In 1960, we see the meeting that is held, I think 1960 and 1961, a meeting is held in Casablanca in Morocco. And the meeting in Casablanca in Morocco is one that once again is attended by true Pan-Africanists. It must always be remembered that even as early as those days, the colonial powers were very clear in their agenda, which sometimes was subtle, sometimes was not very subtle, particularly the French. The French had succeeded in recruiting the leaders of the so-called independent in Francophone Africa, people like Félix Soufé Boigny, people like Silvanus Olympio in Togo, and others. And these were essentially fifth columnists whose agenda was to torpedo the entire process of the fight against colonization. 
so that when the meeting is held in Casablanca in Morocco at that time, and even before we go to Casablanca in Morocco, in 1960, there is another meeting in Accra, Ghana. And at that meeting, we begin to see people beginning to get to gain interest in the struggle for independence. And I go back to 1960 because Franz Fanon is representing Algeria at that time, even before the Algerians have regained their independence. And this is going to be significant because the struggle for decolonization becomes, becomes the, the rallying point in the struggle to unite the African peoples. But we are talking about Casablanca, but the colonialists have succeeded in persuading some Africans that you don't need unity. What you need is national, nationalism, so that we have two groups in 1961. The Casablanca group, which comprises Algeria, Egypt, Guinea, and Libya, and then, of course, we have sometimes what is referred to as the Monrovia or the Brazzaville group. The Monrovia group is led by people like William Tapman, is led by people like uh, 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 the people, the leaders from Nigeria. And you have a number of people who think and are telling Kwame Nukuruma, Kwame, we know you are talking about unity, but we hold the view that Africa cannot be united in the manner that you desire. We are going to retain our nationalism, but we are going to cooperate. But Nukuruma is telling them, this is not the route to take. Ultimately, both the Casablanca group and the Monrovia group meet in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia in 1963. And that is when the Organization of African Unity is founded. So that indeed it is the Monrovia Brazzaville group that wins and Kwame Nkrumah and the Casablanca group loses out. But I want us to listen to the speech of Kwame Nkrumah on the 23rd day of May in 1963 in Addis Ababa. He was as passionate as he was eloquent. He told his audience, and allow me to paraphrase, if we do not come out of this meeting with a united African government, with one army, with one currency, with one capital, I am telling you that the erstwhile colonizer is going to ensure that we are divided. Those of you who are present here are going to get used to your national flags, to your national anthems, to your national mottos. Those of you who are going to be appointed as ministers are going to enjoy the perks that come with your office. Those of you who are here as heads of states and government, you are going to get used to 21 gun salutes and it's not going to be easy to unite Africa. If only they had listened to the Osa Gifo on that day, Africa would have been totally different. But lo and behold, we ended up with a weak organization of African unity whose history we know and whose history we'll discuss on another day. But suffice it to say that after the 1963 meeting, there was yet another meeting in Cairo in 1964. And when we are holding the Cairo meeting in 1964, once again, it is the Monrovia Brazzaville group that is winning. The question at that time, what do we do with the inherited colonial boundaries? There are those who argued at that time that if we move in the direction of changing these boundaries, it will create conflict. At that time, there was already a boundary conflict between Ethiopia and Somalia. And ultimately, in Cairo, we came up with what is the organization Africa's doctrine on the inviolability of the independence boundaries. And it was agreed that the independence boundaries would not be disturbed. And ultimately, of course, we know what that has brought about in terms of undermining African unity. It is also instructive that at that time, there are those who took the view that there was something that was beginning to emerge 
the emergence of the Soviet Union after the World War II and the emergence of the United States of America and therefore a bipolar world. So that the world is forced to look either east nor west. And that is why Kwame Nkrumah says, we should neither look east nor west, we should look forward. And it, you will appreciate that it is then that he writes his book in 1963, Africa Must Unite. And he enters into an arrangement with Ahmed Seko Toure of Guinea, Modibo Keita of Mali, Gamal Abdel Nasser of Egypt, Ahmed Ben Bella of Algeria, Habib Bogiba of Tunisia, and Julius Kambarage Nyerere, and they are working jointly with Jawaharlal Nehru in India, and they come up with the idea of the non-aligned movement, the movement that is non-aligned and positively neutral. We are neither going to look east nor west. A lot of activities are taking place, and Africa is getting undermined. At that time, in 1963, there are 32 independent African countries. What then begins to happen after 1965? 1965 is a marker year because in 1965, Kwame Nkrumah convenes a meeting in Accra, Ghana. And the meeting had two agenda items. Agenda item number one, that we must leave Accra with a united government. Having failed in 1963, we must leave with a united government. Agenda item number two, that we must not forget that there are some African countries which are still under the colonial yoke. And it is incumbent upon all of us to ensure that we begin to move in the direction of guaranteeing their independence. But unfortunately, once again, Kwame Nkrumah did not carry the day. And what ended up happening is that the African Liberation Movement is what was established. And ultimately, the Organization of African Unity did accept to form the African Liberation Committee, which was to be headquartered in Dar es Salaam in Tanzania. But it is critical at that time that the colonialists have started to invade Africa, invade Africa in a very subtle way. The French are active, the British are active, the Portuguese have yet to yield their, uh, their, 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 their colonies in Africa, namely Mozambique, Angola, Guinea-Bissau, and Cape Verde, they are still under the Portuguese tutelage. Equatorial Guinea has also not been freed from the yoke of the Spaniards. Africa is in a very dangerous state. And yet again, it is the Osagie for Kwame Nukuruma, whose name I shall pronounce and state ad nauseum today, because actually he is the high priest of Pan-Africanism. The Osagie for writes a book, Neocolonialism, the last stage of capitalism. Once again, he is warning the people that we cannot afford the luxury of resting on our laurels. And you know, what is sad at that time, through the activities of the colonial powers, is that the era of assassinations and coup d'etats begin in Africa. It begins as early as 1960. Silvanus Olympio is assassinated in 1960, barely a few months after becoming the head of state of Togo. And it's instructive <laughs> that Silvanus Olympio actually escaped to the embassy of the United States of America. And it's instructive that in fact, and is debated that it is the French and the Americans who engineered his death. I know uh, uh, the late President Nassim Ayadam claimed that he is the one who shot him, but who urged him to shoot Olympia? We have started a totally different phase. 
Olympio is dead in 1960. And we now have Lumumba in 1961. Once again, Joseph Kasavubu has been recruited by the Belgians. Mobutu Sese Seko has been recruited by the Belgians. And Patrice Lumumba is assassinated at the behest of these powers, courtesy of Moise Chombe. And Congo has never known peace. You are they are destabilizing these countries to ensure that Africans are not united. And after 1961, in 1966, Kwame Nkrumah himself is overthrown. And after Kwame is removed from power, the Pan-Africanism debate now begins to take the back burner. I'm not, of course, unaware that people like uh, Julius Kambaragi Nyerere are still alive and well. But the truth is that with the death of Kwame Nkrumah, Africa is destabilized. We see now the frequency of coups and some African commentators are now beginning to say that coups were as frequent as breakfast in Africa. Because immediately after Kwame is overthrown, in neighborhood in Nigeria, we see the departure of Namdi Azikiwe and Abubakar Satafawa Balewa, and after that, a series of coups in that part of the world. In Algeria, Ahmed Ben Bella is also overthrown. In Mali, oh, in Mali, Modibo Keita is also overthrown. In Guinea Bissau, of course, not in the 60s, but in the, later in the 70s, in Guinea Bissau, Amilcar Cabral is also overthrown. And you can begin to see that the only people who are spared the coup d'etat are the recruits, recruits such as Felix Oufé Boigny of Côte d'Ivoire, recruits such as Daouda Kairaba Jawara of Guinea, and others who are wishy-washy, people like uh, Leopold Sedar Senghor, although he leads the Negritude movement, but is as much a Francophile as he pretends to be an African. So that there is a sense in which when you go into the entire Sahelian region, whether you are in, uh, in Mauritania, we see a coup d'etat and the, the, the emergence of Mokhtar Oldada, and you go down there and you see the departure of people like David Dako in Central Africa, and the emergence of Jean Bedel Bokassa, and you go into different countries, you see changes have taken place, and all these are designed to undermine Africa. Meanwhile, the question that then arises is that Africa is divided into this new world. You will remember I talked about the bipolar world, the United States of America, and the Soviet Union. They themselves are engaged in recruitment, and I think this is very critical, so that we are better able to appreciate why the Pan-African movement is now undermined. We now have those who are aligned to the East and those who are aligned to the West and Africa becomes a theater of conflict. And we have recruits such as Mobutu Sisseko doing all manner of evil in the Democratic Republic of Congo, but you cannot remove them because the United States of America ensures that they are there. People like Jean Bad Bokassa are cannibals, but you can't remove them. And even, in the North, and sometimes I hear this debate whether our Arab friends are also a candidate for Pan-Africanism. Permit me to remind my audience and you, Keith and Kin and brethren, that in the early days of the struggle, beyond being, being a Pan-Arabist, Pan Gamal Abdel Nasser of Egypt was a great Pan-Africanist. Ahmed Ben Bella of Algeria was a great Pan-Africanist. Habib Bogiba of Tunisia was equally a great Pan-Africanist. And it is instructive that much later in the year 2000, the real successor in terms of enthusiasm and passion for Africa was to be Muammar al-Gaddafi of Libya in 2002 when he signed the agreement for the formation of the AU in Sirte and ultimately its adoption in Johannesburg in South Africa. In a nutshell, what one is saying and why this history is important 
It helps us to understand why the enterprise was torpedoed by the machinations of the Western powers who do not want to see Africa united. But allow me to backpedal a little. As we are talking about the African liberation movement and Pan-Africanism, we must also remember that many African countries were still not free from the colonial yoke. And that is why in addition to the uh, African liberation movement that was established in Dar es Salaam in Tanzania in 1975, for the purpose only of focusing on the countries that were not independent in the Southern African countries, the frontline state was created and adopted by the OAU in 1975 with Mwalimu Julius Kambarage Nyerere as the chair. And the agenda of the frontline states, and the, which comprised the Tanzania, Zimbabwe, Angola, uh, uh, Zambia, those states were mandated with the task of ensuring that Mozambique was free, Rhodesia then, which is Zimbabwe, was free, Namibia was free, Angola was free, and South Africa to be liberated from the apartheid regime. And it is critical to appreciate that it is the pan-African spirit that informed the formation of the frontline state. The apartheid regime was raiding these countries every so often. We remember at one time an armored column nearly reached Angola, Luanda in Angola. But ultimately, through the efforts of the frontline state, which was chaired, as I've said, by Malimu Julius Kambaragi Nyerere between 1975 and 1985, when Kenneth David Kaunda of Zambia now took over, these were sacrificial. And they were designed to ensure that once we are all free, we can now unite and begin to look at the agenda of Pan-Africanism in the manner that was conceived in the 1960, and if you go a little further, even in the 1900s. What then happened with the frontline state? Because I think this is very critical, because a lot of energy was being consumed by the countries which were still under the colonial yoke. In Angola, we see that even as we have parties that are fighting, there are some parties which are not pan-Africanist. FNLA of Holden Roberto, UNITA of Jonas Malheiro Savimbi, and of course, we have Agostino Neto's MPLA. It succeeds because it is supported and it is assumed that Neto is going to join in the pan-African agenda. Equally, when the Pan-Africanists are supporting ZANU-PF at that time, or the ZANU-PF uh, ZANU and ZAPU at that time, it is assumed that after uh, uh, Robert Mugabe and Joshua Nkomo regain power from the Smith administration, they will strengthen the African movement. And equally, when we see in Mozambique, after the death of Eduardo Monlein, and the emergence of Samora Moises Marshall, we are convinced that these are people who are going to be the engines of the struggle for independence. And of course, we also know that at that time, uh, Sam Nuyoma in Namibia is also ensuring that we, we, we are moving in that direction. So that in 1994, when Nelson Mandela becomes the president of South Africa and the apartheid regime has been decimated, we now know that indeed the Pan-Africanist movement and when Mandela attends the organization of African meeting in June in Tunis, Tunisia and sits, Africa celebrates. It celebrates because there are now 53 independent African countries no African country is under the colonial yoke. Of course, you now know that we are 54 countries with South Sudan having broken away in the year 2011. But at that time, we celebrated because apartheid was over. And this once again brings me to the entire question of Pan-Africanism. It is something that is alive today as it is as it was alive in the early days. 
because I've mentioned South Africa a little bit, I want us to backpedal to the year 1906, just to inform us, particularly the younger Africans, that the idea of Pan-Africanism was an old one. You know, as I said a little earlier in 1900, uh, Williams from Trinidad was calling a meeting in London, and we had the meetings in Manchester, and we had all these meetings of the Pan-African movement. You remember in 1945, we talked about the Manchester meeting, the Pan-African meeting in 1974. We had a Pan-African meeting in Dar es Salaam. In 1994, we had a Pan-African meeting in Kampala, Uganda. And in the year 2014, we had a Pan-African meeting in Johannesburg, South Africa. Where does that spirit come from? It came, as I've already said, in the 1900s, but I wanted to speak about, of an event in 1906. This was a speech that was delivered on the fifth day of April 1906 in Columbia, University of Columbia, by a great South African, to whom South Africans don't give much credit, Pixley Kaisaka Seme. In that speech, which I commend to everybody, entitled The Regeneration of Africa, Pixley Kaisa Kaseme looks at Africa and he says, among other things, that I look to the day when I go through the Sahara and I cast my eyes beyond Sahara and I go down into the Congo and I look at the lush equatorial of Congo and I go beyond that and look to King Chief Kamar of the Bechwana, and I go beyond that, and I go to Angola, and I go down to South Africa, that I look forward to the day when Africa will be regenerated. Pixley Kaisa Kaseme is clear about the Pan-African agenda. So today, when we talk about Pan-Africanism against the history that one can only do justice to a certain extent, given the constraints of time, we find ourselves at a time when we have gone through those phases. Africa has seen independence. Africa has seen post-independence. Africa has seen coup d'etats. Africa has seen guerrilla movements. Africa has seen civil wars. Africa has seen genocides in Rwanda. Africa has seen ethnic wars, Africa has seen religious wars, but amidst all these, there is a single spirit that remains alive and well. And that spirit is that we must be united. And that is why to talk about Pan-Africanism in its latter day understanding, when the organization of African unity Heads of states and government gathered in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia to celebrate 50 years after the formation of the OAU in 1963. South Africa's Nkosazana Dlamini, Nkosazana Zuma, who was then the chair wrote an imaginary letter to Kwame Nukuruma. I will paraphrase the letter because she was saying in effect, Mrs. Zuma, he was telling the Osagiefo, how had we listened to you? Africa would be different. How had we listened to you? We would now be united. And we would not be at the dinner table of the Americans, of the Europeans, of the Italian stock, or the English stock, or the French stock, or the German stock. We would not be at the dinner table being humiliated by the Chinese. Zuma wrote that imaginary letter and said, but all is not lost. I can look forward to the day when Africa will have regained our lust, 
when the Democratic Republic of Congo will be the engine of Africa, when there'll be a railway line from Addis Ababa in Ethiopia to Dakar in Senegal, when there'll be a railway line from Cape Town in South Africa to Cairo in Egypt. Zuma writes that imaginary letter to Kwame Nukuru. And I want to believe that that is the basis of Africa Agenda 2063. Because Africa Agenda 2063 is actually a rehash of what Kwame Nukuruma was saying in the 1960s. So, so that today when we talk about Agenda 2063, we must see it in the context of the lost opportunity and the desire of Africa that by 2063 we will be united but i hope that it will be sooner rather than later that is how i understand the africa continental free trade area signed in kigali rwanda in the year 2018 which tells us that we must now unite that is how i understand the yamasukuru agreement we say that the african skies must be open that is how I understand the Maputo protocol. That is how I understand all these protocols. That is how I even understood at Lalia the Lagos plan of action of 1980 of ensuring that Africa grows as one unit. Today, when we talk about Pan-Africanism, we must remind ourselves that Pan-Africanism is about uniting us. We must tell ourselves whether we are Africans in the mother continent or we are Africans in the United States of America or we are Africans in the Caribbean, whether you are in Jamaica or Barbados or Barbuda or in Brazil or in Europe, Africans in the diaspora, we are saying that the time is now when Africa must begin to rethink. We are telling ourselves that the parties that invoked the name of Pan-Africanism must now revive. Every political party in Africa must now ask the question, when will we dissolve all these boundaries? When will it be possible in the spirit of Pan-Africanism that I can move without let and hindrance from Johannesburg in South Africa through to Namibia and from Namibia through to Lesotho and from Lesotho through to Eswatini and from Eswatini through to Mozambique and from Mozambique through to or to, to, to Zimbabwe and from Zimbabwe through to Angola and from Angola to Equatorial Guinea and from Equatorial Guinea I can move to Malawi and Zambia and have a detour of the Comoros and from Comoros to Madagascar and to the Seychelles and I, as I come up I'm able to move into Tanzania and to the Democratic Republic of Congo and I don't stop there I move to Uganda and I move to Rwanda and to Burundi and to Nairobi move to Eritrea and to Somalia and I don't stop there I go to Djibouti and from there I move to South Sudan and to Sudan and I don't stop there I go to Egypt and I go to Tunisia and I don't stop there and I come down into Algeria and I don't stop there and I go to Morocco and I don't stop there and I go to Gambia and I don't stop there and I go to Senegal and I go to Mauritania and I go to Niger and I go to Nigeria, and I go to Burkina Faso, and I don't stop there, I come to Central African Republic, I come to Cameroon, I come to Amazonia, to Togo, Benin, to Liberia, and to Sierra Leone, and Guinea, and Guinea-Bissau, and to Liberia, so that I don't need a passport to move in that way. Today, Africa has currencies, which none of which is called a hard currency. We are here during the corona, and some of us are now trying to hold dollars because our countries mean nothing outside of our boundaries. I look forward to the day because what, that is what Pan-Africanism is all about. I look forward to the day when there is only one currency and that currency, whether you call it Afro or you call it any other name, it is a currency that we can use. 
I look forward to the day when the South Africans will not be threatened by the Nigerians or the Ghanaians threatened by the Nigerians. I look forward to the day when I can set shop in Cape Town and nothing happens. And that is how I understand latter-day Pan-Africans such as Toma Isidore Sankara. Toma Isidore Sankara took power in 1985, 1983, and within five years, he had come up and was speaking a different language. Sometimes when we talk about Toma Sankara, we think he was the age of Kwame Nukuruma. He lived in our lifetime, but he used the opportunity of energizing the process of Pan-Africanism. That is why I understand latter-day Pan-Africanists such as my good friend Julius Silo Malema, who on a daily basis are telling Africans that our only salvation lies in our unity, are reminding us that we cannot survive the onslaught of the Chinese if we are disunited. We cannot realize our potential if we are disunited. I hold the view that Pan-Africanism is our avenue to success. I hold the view that Pan-Africanism must now be understood not differently but in the manner that it was conceived by Kwame Nukuruma, in the manner that was understood by Julius Kambarake Nyerere. But Kwame Nukuruma is not telling us from the grave that his ideas are set in stone. Kwame Nukuruma is telling us that you, the younger generation, must now take the baton. And this brings me to the speech that I started with. The speech that was delivered on the 6th day of March, 1997, by Julius Kambarage Nyerere, had stopped at a point when Mwalimu had said that our salvation demanded that we are united. And he said, if Africans think that they can respect their so-called boundaries in these little unviable countries, then God save them. But God is not in the business of saving those who have chosen to embrace stupidity for its own sake, Malimu said. Malimu said that when he retired as the president of Tanzania, whenever he went out and he was introduced as the president of Tanzania, some in his audience asked, and what is Tanzania? Is Tanzania next to Johannesburg? They do not know, Walimu said. But they recognized the fact that he was an African. He reminded us that it is not our Tanzanian-ness that matters. It is not our Kenyan-ness. It is not our Uganda-ness or South African-ness or Namibia-ness or Angola-ness that matters. It is our African-ness. When the Chinese are punishing our Africans in Guangzhou, in China, during this corona period, they make no distinction between Nigerian and Ghanaian and Kenyan. All they see is our black skin. When we are being humiliated in European airports and are being asked for all manner of vaccination, and I suspect that in the coming future, we will not go to Europe unless we have a, a vaccine which is manufactured by Roche or some other pharmaceutical company in Europe. We will not be allowed to go into that part of the world. When our great sons and daughters in the diaspora are being humiliated in the United States of America or in Brazil, they are not asking whether they are Ghanaians or whether they are Guineans or whether they are Central African Republic, and they are saying, these are African, they are of one stock. Mwalimu was saying, and he said that our generation may have been successful in midwifing the process of independence. The time is now. 
that you younger generation must now take the baton and ensure that all these little organizations that you have created, East African community, SADAC, ECOWAS, Maghreb, Central African unity, combine them into one so that Africa can be united. And we are not being naive in saying that we will be united immediately. We must begin to move in the direction. Because I'm being hosted from South Africa, I want to remember something that I saw as a young man in the 1980. It is a documentary prepared by a great Pan-Africanist and a Kenyan, Professor Ali Mazurui. Africa, a triple heritage. And in that particular documentary, he talks about many things, but I'm choosing only one because it captures a conversation with the current president of South Africa, Matemela Cyril Ramaphosa, who was then the Secretary General of the Trade Union. In those younger days, he had appeared. In those younger days, he smoked and smoked in style. And as Mazurui talks about him, he says, that there have been many trade unionists who have been in the struggle for the liberation of Africa. And he said, Seko Ture was a trade unionist. Patrice Emery Lumumba was a trade unionist. Whether Ramaphosa will one day move from trade unionism to political leadership, I do not know. Mazurui was not a Jewish prophet, but Matemela Siri Ramaphosa is now the president, not only of South Africa, but the chair of the African Union. How I wish that when he leaves that office of the chair of the AU, he will have embraced the spirit of the Osagia for Kwame Nukurum. He will have embraced the spirit of Julius Kambara Genyerer. He will have embraced the spirit of Thomas Sankara. He will have embraced the spirit of Modibo Keita. He will have embraced the spirit of Ahmed Ben Bella. He will have embraced the spirit of Amilka Cabral. He will have embraced the spirit of Nelson Holissa as Mandela, and he will lead the continent towards unit so that historians may remember him fondly. How I wish that Pan-Africanism going forward will mean that from today henceforth, wherever we are in mother continent, wherever we are in the diaspora, we will now begin to read from the same script, a script which says our inherited boundaries mean little, a spirit which says that our unity must mean that we improve intra-African trade. A spirit which says that we must now have a single passport. A spirit which says that we must have a single currency. A spirit which says that we must standardize our education. A spirit which says that all the resources of Africa will be utilized for the benefit of Africa. A spirit which says that we shall not discriminate amongst ourselves. A spirit which says that there will be no xenophobia. A spirit which says that our success lies in our unity. A spirit which says that we shall no longer accept things that are conceived from Europe and America and swallow them lock, stock and barrel. A spirit which says that our continent is capable of achieving for ourselves. A spirit which says that our men and women in the diaspora who are some of our best brains can have something to come back to Africa for. A spirit which says that united we stand and divided we fall. A spirit which says that Africa can actually survive. 
And that is why it gladdens me when I move across the continent of Africa now and I see younger Africans whom you will never hear about in the newspapers and I meet them. In the recent past, I've had the occasion to listen to great African minds. The lady who was dismissed by the African Union, Dr. Arikana Chihombri Kwao, who in the recent past has come out and made our position known against the French manipulation. I've met her. I've not only met her, I've also met and read great Africans. Nana Kobina Nkesia from Ghana, who has written about the need for Africa to have a different governance system. I've had the occasion of reading great Africans, such as the great Cameroonian, Achille Mbembe, who from Witwaters Rand University writes about Africa. I've listened keenly to other great Africans. I've mentioned him before, Silo Julius Malema. Young Africans who sometimes may irritate us but is it not our duty to be irritated by younger generation? In fact, I dare say that the young generation must only have one mantra and only one claim to fame, that they must irritate those who are in power so effectively and in such an organized manner that they'll have no choice but to do that which is good and right. I've met a young Zambian, Kelvin Kaunda, founded a university, the Eden University, teaching about Pan-Africanism. I can go on and on, but there is no reason why we should give up. We should not give up on any one of us because united we stand, divided we fall.